Section 11 of the American Civil War Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jyoti Tharavanat. The Battle of Spring Hill, Tennessee by John K. Schallenberger Section 1 Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States Commandery of the State of Missouri The Battle of Spring Hill, Tennessee Prepared by Companion Captain John K. Schallenberger Read after the stated meeting held February 2nd, 1907. Preface More than twenty-five years have passed since I began to collect the materials from which this pamphlet has been evolved. As a substantial basis, to begin with, I was an eyewitness of all the fighting in the vicinity of Spring Hill that amounted to anything. From the time Forrest attacked the 64th Ohio on the skirmish line until Cleburne's division recoiled from the fire of the battery posted at the village. Since I began collecting, I have neglected no opportunity to increase my stock of information by conversation, reading, or correspondence. I have twice revisited the battlefield. I had the government volume containing the official reports, all of which I have carefully studied. Among my correspondents on the Union side have been Generals Stanley, Wilson, Updike, Lane, and Bradley, besides many others of lesser rank. I am as confident from their letters that my paper would have the approval of those named, who are now dead, and I am sure it has the approval of General Wilson, to whom a manuscript copy was submitted for criticism. Among other confederates, I wrote to General S. D. Lee, who referred me to Judge J. P. Young of Memphis, Tennessee, with a statement that he had exhausted the subject on the confederate side. He was present at Spring Hill as a boy soldier in Forrest's cavalry, and for years has been engaged in writing a history of the Confederate Army of Tennessee, to which he has given an enormous amount of careful research. To him I am indebted for much of the most valuable part of my information concerning the Confederate troops. From the materials thus gathered, I have tried to give, within the compass of loyal Legion paper, a clear and truthful account of the affair just as it happened. That opinions will differ is shown by the fact that Judge Young holds General Brown responsible for the Confederate failure, while I believe that Cheatham, Stewart, and Bate were all greater sinners than Brown. He was acting under the eye of Cheatham, who could have easily have forced an attack by Brown's division if he had been equal to the occasion. By a curious coincidence, General Lee was present as the guest of the Missouri commandery at the meeting when the paper was read, and in commenting on it, General Lee stated that I had told the truth about as it had occurred. The deductions made from the facts stated are my own. The Battle of Spring Hell it may be fairly claimed that the success of General Sherman's famous march to the sea hung on the issue of a minor battle fought at Spring Hill in Middle Tennessee the evening of November 29, 1864, when Sherman and his army were hundreds of miles away in the heart of Georgia. It will be remembered that when Sherman started from Atlanta for Savannah, his old antagonist, General Hood was at Florence, Alabama, refitting his army to the limit of the waning resources of the Confederacy for an aggressive campaign into Tennessee. If Hood's campaign had proved successful, 
Sherman's unopposed march through Georgia would have been derided as a crazy freak, and no doubt the old charge of insanity would have been revived against him. By how narrow a margin Hood missed a brilliant success, a truthful account of the Spring Hill affair will disclose. Much has been written by interested generals of both sides, and by their partisan friends, to mislead as to the real situation. With no personal friendships or enmities to subserve, it is the intention of this paper to tell the truth without any regard to its effect on the reputation of any general, federal or confederate. The administration gave a reluctant consent to Sherman's plan on the condition that he would leave with General Thomas, commanding in Tennessee, a force strong enough to defeat Hood. On paper, Thomas had plenty of men, but Sherman had taken his pick of infantry, cavalry, artillery, and transportation, leaving the odds and ends with Thomas, consisting largely of post-troops garrisoning towns, bridge guards and blockhouses along the railroads, new regiments recruited by the payment of the big bounties that produced the infamous tribe of bounty jumpers, Negro regiments never yet tested in battle, green drafted men assigned to some of the old depleted regiments in such large numbers as to change their veteran character, dismounted cavalrymen sent back to get horses, and convalescents and followed men belonging to the army which Sherman would come up too late to join their commands, organized into temporary companies and regiments. Moreover, Thomas's forces were scattered from East Tennessee to Central Missouri, where General A.J. Smith, with two divisions of the 16th Corps, was marching for St. Louis to take steamboats to join Thomas at Nashville. The only force available for immediate field service consisted of the 4th and 23rd Corps, the two weakest corps of Sherman's army, which he had sent back to Thomas. These two corps, temporarily commanded by General Schofield, were thrown well forward towards Florence to delay Hood long enough for Thomas to concentrate and organize from his widely scattered resources a force strong enough to give battle to Hood. Passing over all prayer operations, we will take up the situation as it was the morning of November 29th. General Schofield had then well in hand on the north bank of Duck River, opposite Columbia, Tennessee, the divisions of Kimball, Wagner, and Wood, composing the 4th Corps, and of Cox and Ruger of the 23rd Corps, Ruger's lacking one brigade, on detached service. Across the river were two divisions of General S. D. Lee's corps of Hood's army. The preceding evening, Hood himself, with the corps of Chatham and Stuart, and Johnson's division of Lee's corps, had moved up the river five and one half miles to Davis Ford where he was laying his pontoons preparatory to crossing. His plan was to detain Scofield at the river by fainting with two divisions, while he would lead seven divisions past the left flank and plant them across Scofield's line of retreat at Spring Hill, twelve miles north of Duck River. As Hood greatly outnumbered Schofield, his plan contemplated the destruction of Schofield's army. During the evening of the 28th, General Wilson, commanding our cavalry, had learned enough of Hood's movement to divine its purpose. In view of its vital importance to ensure a delivery, he sent a message in triplicate each courier riding by a separate road, informing Schofield of what Hood was doing, and advising and urging him to get back to Spring Hill with all his army by ten o'clock the twenty-ninth. General Wilson has stated that his couriers all got through, the one riding by the shortest road 
reaching Scofield's headquarters at 3 a.m. of the 29th. From the report sent him by Wilson, General Thomas at Nashville had also correctly divined Hood's intention, and in a dispatch dated 3.30 a.m. of the 29th, but by the neglect of the night operator, not transmitted until 6 o'clock when the day operator came on duty, he ordered Schofield to fall back to Franklin, leaving a sufficient force at Spring Hill to delay Hood until he was securely posted at Franklin. I was commanding Company B, 64th Ohio Regiment, Bradley's Brigade, Wagner's Division. The brigade was under arms that morning by four o'clock and had orders to be ready to march on a moment's notice. It is assumed that all the rest of the army received the same orders, and that this action was taken on account of the information brought by Wilson's courier at three o'clock. But nothing was done until eight o'clock, when the movements began which disposed of our army as follows. Wagner's division was sent to Spring Hill to guard the reserve artillery and the wagon trains, all ordered to Spring Hill, from any raid by Hood's cavalry. General Stanley, the corps commander, went with Wagner. Cox's division was posted along the river and was engaged all day in skirmishing with the two divisions under Lee, which kept up a noisy demonstration of forcing a crossing. Ruger's two brigades were posted four miles north of Duck River, where the pike to Spring Hill crosses Rutherford's Creek to hold that crossing. The divisions of Kimball and Wood were aligned between Cox and Ruger, facing up the river towards Hood's Crossing. At nine o'clock, Post's brigade of Wood's division was sent up the river to reconnoiter, and before eleven o'clock, Post had reached a position where he could see Hood's column marching towards Spring Hill, and repeatedly reported that fact. Nevertheless, none of the four divisions near Duck River were started for Spring Hill until after four o'clock, when Schofield had heard from Stanley that Hood was attacking at Spring Hill. After the campaign, Schofield claimed that its success was due to his intimate knowledge of Hood's character gained while they were classmates at West Point, which enabled him to foresee what a hood would do under any given conditions, and then make the best dispositions for defeating him. When two months later, Schofield was in Washington, where they knew nothing about the details of the campaign, he so successfully impressed his claim on the administration that he was given the same promotion with which General Sheridan had been rewarded for the victory at Manchester, jumping at one bound from the rank of captain to that of brigadier general in the regular army. But it is plain that after five hours of deliberation that morning, Schofield had reached a wrong conclusion as to Hood's intention, for if actions speak louder than words, there can be no question that Schofield's dispositions were made under the conviction that Hood would march down the river after crossing to clear the way for Lee to cross, and so deeply infatuated was he with this self-imposed delusion that, disregarding the order of Thomas and the advice of Wilson, he cherished it for about five hours after Post had reported that Hood was marching towards Spring Hill. Wagner's advance, double-quicking through Spring Hill at noon and deploying just beyond on a run, interposed barely in time to head off the advance of Hood's cavalry, Wagner arriving by the Columbia Pike from the southwest and the cavalry by the Mount Carmel Road from the east. General Forrest, commanding Hood's cavalry, had used his superior numbers so skillfully as to push back Wilson with our cavalry just north of Mount Carmel, which is five miles east of Spring Hill, before noon. Leaving one brigade to watch Wilson, Forrest then crossed over to Spring Hill with all the rest of his three divisions of cavalry. 
If Wagner had arrived a few minutes later, he would have found Forrest in possession at Spring Hill. General Cox, in his book on this campaign, claims that General Wilson committed a grave error in not crossing over to Spring Hill in advance of Forrest with all our cavalry. But in justice to Wilson, it must be remembered that at Mount Carmel he acted under the belief that Schofield was following the advice he had given early that morning. If Schofield had been at Spring Hill at 10 o'clock, as Wilson had advised, with all his infantry, what reason could there have been for the cavalry joining him there? When Bradley's brigade, the rear of Wagner's column, was nearing Spring Hill, some of the cavalry approached the pike through the fields to reconnoiter, and the 64th Ohio was sent to drive them away. With the right wing deployed as skirmishers on the left wing and reserve, the regiment advanced steadily, driving before it the cavalry, without replying to the harmless long-range fire they kept up with their carbines, but always galloping away before we could get within effective range. About a mile east of the pike, we crossed the Rally Hill Road. This was the road by which Hood's infantry column approached. It there runs north nearly parallel of the pike to a point 500 yards east of Spring Hill, where it turns west to enter the village. Leaving one of the reserve companies to watch the road, the rest of the regiment kept on in pursuit of the cavalry until our skirmishers were abreast of the Caldwell House, about 800 yards east of the road, when a halt was called. A few minutes later, at 2.30 o'clock, the left of our skirmish line north of the Caldwell House was attacked by a line of battle in front, while the cavalry worked around our left flank. At the time we believed the battle line to be a part of Hood's infantry, and in a letter from General Bradley he states that it caused great consternation at headquarters in Spring Hill when Major Coulter, off the 64th, came galloping back with the information that the regiment was fighting with infantry. But investigation has disclosed that the battle line was composed of mounted infantry belonging to Forrest Command. They were armed with Enfield rifles and always fought on foot like ordinary infantry, using the horses for traveling rapidly from place to place. The four reserve companies were thrown in on a run at the point of contact, but our line was soon forced to fall back by the cavalry turning our left flank, where they cut off and captured three of our skirmishers. One of the three was badly wounded that evening in trying to escape, a bullet entering from behind and passing through his mouth in a way to knock out nearly one half of all his teeth. We found him in a hospital at Spring Hill when passing through in pursuit of Hood's army after the victory at Nashville. In relating his experience, he stated that when they were captured, they were taken before some general, name unknown to him, who questioned them closely as to what force was holding Spring Hill. The general was probably Forrest, for he was personally directing the attack on the 64th, but may have been a Hood himself, for he was on the Rally Hill Road less than a mile away soon after the men were captured. They all declared that they knew the 4th Corps was at Spring Hill, and they believed all the rest of the army. Their declaration must have carried greater weight on account of their own faith in what they were telling, for at that time the whole regiment believed that all the rest of the army had followed to Spring Hill close on the heels of Wagner's division. Eventually the 64th was driven back across the Rally Hill Road where a last stand was made in a large woods covering a broad ridge abutting on the road about three-fourths of a mile southeast of Spring Hill. While in these woods occurred a bit of exciting personal experience. A bullet coming from the right passed through my overcoat, buttoned up to my chin, in a way to take along the top button of my blouse underneath the coat. That big brass button struck me, a stinging blow on the point of the left collarbone, and 
Clasping both hands to the spot, I commenced feeling for the hole with my fingertips, fully convinced that a bullet coming from the front had gone through me there and had inflicted a serious and possibly a mortal wound. It was not until I had opened the court for a closer investigation that I found I was worse scared than hurt. Some of the enemy had secured a position on our right flank, where they opened an enfilidating fire, and it was one of their bullets that had hit me. To get out of that fire, the regiment fell back towards the interior of the woods, where it was so close to our main line that it was called in. It was then about 3.30 o'clock and by that time the situation of our army had become so critical that nothing short of the grossest blundering on the part of the enemy could save it from a great disaster, and there was a fine possibility for destroying it. Wagner's division had so much property to protect that it was stretched out on a line extending from the railway station nearly a mile northwest of Springhill where two trains of cars were standing on the track, around by the north, east and south, to the Columbia Pike on the southwest. Behind this long line, the village streets and the adjacent fields were crammed with nearly everything on wheels belonging to our army, ambulances, artillery carriages, and army wagons to the number of about 800 vehicles. The nearest support was Ruger's two brigades, eight miles away, and it was about an hour later that Ruger had started for Spring Hill. Updike's brigade was covering the railway station and the Franklin Pike on the north, and Lane's brigade the Mount Carmel Road on the east. They had a connected line, but it was so long that much of it consisted of skirmishes only. They had in their front detachments of forest cavalry feeling along their line for an opening to get at the trains. Bradley's brigade occupied an advanced detached position on the ridge to the southeast that has been mentioned to cover the approach by the Raleigh Hill Road. There was a gap of half a mile between Lane's right in front of Spring Hill and Bradley's left out on the ridge. Bradley had in his immediate front the main body of Forrest's three division of cavalry and the three divisions of infantry composing Cheaton's corps, while four more divisions of infantry were within easy supporting distance. In brief, ten of the twelve divisions, cavalry included, composing Hood's army, were in front of Spring Hill, and at four o'clock Hood was attacking with his infantry Wagner's lone division, guarding all our trains, while Schofield was still waiting for Hood at Duck River with four divisions from eight to twelve miles away. If Wagner's division had been wiped out, a very easy possibility for the overwhelming numbers confronting it while stretching out on a line about three miles long without any breastworks, the rich prize of our ambulance trains, six batteries of artillery, and all our wagons with their loads of supplies would have fallen into Hood's hands, and the retreat of our four divisions would have been squarely cut off, while having a short supply of artillery and no food or ammunition except what the men were carrying in their haversacks and cartridge boxes. The escape of our army from this deadly peril was largely due to the great skill with which General Stanley handled the situation at Spring Hill, but manifestly no amount of skill on the part of Stanley could have saved us, where the disadvantages were so great. If the enemy had improved with a very ordinary degree of vigor and intelligence, the opportunity opened to them by Schofield's delusion as to Hood's intention. General Hood rode with the advance of his column until after it had crossed Rutherford's Creek, two and one-half miles south of Spring Hill. It was then about three o'clock. There was no bridge and his men had to wade the creek, which caused some delay. A short distance north of the crossing, Hood met Forrest, and got his report 
of the situation at Spring Hill as he had developed it during the three hours preceding. He had met with resistance on so long a line that no doubt he greatly overestimated the force holding Spring Hill, and as such an estimate would agree with the story told by the captured 64th man. On the other hand, a courier had arrived with a report from Lee that Schofield's main body was still in his front at Duck River, and Lee's report was confirmed by the sounds of the heavy cannonading that had been coming from his direction. These reports disclosed that a part of Schofield's army was at Spring Hill and a part at Duck River but they conflicted as to which position was held by his main body. In the uncertainty thus arising, Hood decided, as his dispositions clearly show, that his first move must be to plant Cheatham's Craw on the pike between these two parts. Developments would then determine his next move. Cleburne's division was the first to cross the creek, and marching up the road until his advance was close to the woods where Forrest's men were fighting with the 64th Ohio, Cleburne halted and formed his battle line along the road facing west towards the Columbia Pike. If the intention had been to make a direct attack, his line would have formed facing north towards our line, the woods, where its position had been developed by Forrest. The intention, unquestionably, was for Cleburne avoiding any encounter with our line in the woods, first to cross over to the pike and then change direction and advance on Spring Hill astride the pike, while Bates' division, following Cleburne's, received orders as reported by Bates to cross to the pike and then sweep down the pike towards Columbia. Hood himself gave the orders to Cleburne and Bate, and then established his headquarters at the Thompson farmhouse nearby, about 500 yards west of the Raleigh Hill Road, and nearly two miles south of Spring Hill, where he remained till next morning. To save time, Cleburne started for the pike as soon as he was ready, and Bate, then forming on Cleburne's left, followed as soon as his formation was completed. While Cleburne and Bate were moving out, General Cheatham was at the crossing, hurrying over Brown's division. When Brown got over, he could support either Cleburne or Bate, as developments might dictate. Uncandid statements have been made that Cheatham's divisions were moved around in a disjointed manner and without any plan. There was not only a logical plan, but a successful plan, if it had been carried out, in the orders given to Cheatham's divisions. The other four divisions were halted south of Rutherford's Creek and fronted into line facing west towards the Columbia Pike. This proves that it was then Hood's belief that Schofield's main body was still at Duck River. If it should march up the pike and attack bait, the four divisions would be on its flank. If it should attempt to reach the fortifications at Moorsfree Free Bro by cutting across the country south of Spring Hill, the four divisions would be in a position to intercept it. General Bradley had four regiments in line in the woods on the ridge, with the left towards the Raleigh Hill Road and the right treading away towards the pike. They faced in a southeasterly direction. To cover more ground, there were short gaps between the regiments. The 65th Ohio was the right regiment of the four, and to the right rear of the 65th, was a gap of a couple of hundred yards extending out into clear land where the 42nd Illinois was posted, refused as to the 65th and facing south to cover that flank. To the front, 
right and rear of the 42nd was a broad expanse of rolling fields extending on the right to the back about thousand yards away where two guns were posted to sweep the fields in front of the 42nd with their fire. To the left of the 42nd, an extension of the woods ran out into the fields and concealed the 42nd from Cleburne until he had advanced almost abreast of its position. When the 64th came off the skirmish line, it was sent to the support of the 42nd. The 36th Illinois, of Dyke's only reserve, was hurried across on double quick from the other side of Spring Hill to support the two guns of the pike. As many guns of the reserve artillery as could be utilized were placed in battery around the southeast early skirt of the village, looking towards Bradley's position. Bradley's men very hastily had constructed weak barricades of rails or anything else they could lay their hands on. The 42nd had such protection as was afforded by a rail fence. Shortly before four o'clock, having completed his formation, Cleburne started to march across to the pike. His division consisted of four brigades, but one was on detached duty and he had three in line, Lowry's on his right, then Govan's, then Granbury's. First crossing a field in his front, Lowry entered the extension of the woods that has been mentioned, on when emerging on the other side, his right came in view within easy reach of the 42nd, and that regiment opened an enfiladating fire. Lowry's line being then almost perpendicular to the line of the 42nd. It was this accident of Lowry's right passing within range of the 42nd that led to the failure of Hood's plan, which up to that minute had been a great success. When the 42nd opened fire, the two guns of the pike also opened, their fire crossing that of the 42nd, and the 64th running forward and intermingling ranks with the 42nd poured in their fire. When our fire had thus developed our position, out in those wide fields they could see just what we had. They pulled down the rims of their old hats over their eyes, bent their heads to the storm of missiles pouring upon them, changed direction to their right on double quick in a manner that excited our admiration, and a little later a long line came sweeping through the wide gap between the right of the 42nd and the pike and swinging in towards our rear. Our line stood firm holding back the enemy in front until the flank movement had progressed so far as to make it a question of legs to escape capture when the regimental commanders gave the reluctant order to fall back. The contact was then so close that as the men on our right were running past the line closing in on them, they were called on with loud oaths, charging them with a Yankee canine descent to halt and surrender and not heeding the call, some of them were shot down with the muzzles of the muskets almost touching their bodies. By the recession of the two regiments on the flank, the rear of the four regiments in the woods became exposed. They were attacked at the same time by Forrest in front and by Cleburne on their right and rear, and were speedily dislodged. The attack was pressed with so much vigor that in a few minutes after the 42nd had opened fire, Bradley's entire brigade was in rapid retreat towards Spring Hill, with Cleburne in close pursuit and pouring in a hot fire. In falling back, we had to cross the valley of a small stream, and I never think of our strenuous exertions to get out of a destructive crossfire while running down the easy slope leading to the stream without recalling the story of the officer who called to a soldier, making the best time he could to get out of a hot fire. Stop, my man! What are you running for? Because I had no wings to fly with, called back the soldier over his shoulder, while increasing his efforts to make better time. As we descended into the valley, we uncovered our pursuers 
to the fire of the battery at the village, which opened the sharpener shells, firing over our heads. General Stanley, who was in the battery, reported that not less than eight guns opened fire. As soon as Cleburne encountered that fire, he hastily drew back over the ridge, out of sight, all pursuit with its accompanying direct and cross-fire having thus ceased, Bradley's men stopped running, and walked on back to the vicinity of the battery, where a new line was formed without trouble or confusion. When coming down the slope towards the stream, Major Coulter, whose horse had been killed, was running a few feet in front of me, and I was just speculating whether my short legs could keep up with his long ones, when he called back over his shoulder, Rally at this fence, meaning a rail fence we were approaching. I had a poor opinion of the fence as a place to attempt a rally, for we would still be exposed to a cross-fire. But wishing to obey orders, I made for the strongest-looking fence corner in my front, and jumping over and stopping behind it, looked around to see if any concerted effort would be made to reform behind the fence. In my brief halt there, I had some opportunity to observe the effect of our artillery fire on the enemy. I saw by the smoke where a number of our shells exploded, and they all seemed too high in the air and too far to the rear, for I could not see any men knocked down by them. No doubt the fear of killing some of our own men caused our gunners to aim high, and it is probable that the noise made by so many guns and exploding shells had more to do with stopping the enemy than the execution that was done. Their after actions showed that they believed Bradley's brigade to have been an outpost, that our main line was where the battery was posted, and that so much artillery must have a correspondingly strong infantry support. General Bradley reported a loss of 198 men in his brigade, nearly all of it falling on the three regiments on the exposed flank the other three regiments falling back with light loss because their position had become untenable. He was disabled with a wound, and Colonel Conrad of the 15th Missouri then assumed command of the brigade. By the casualties in the 65th Ohio, the command of that regiment devolved upon the adjutant Brewer Smith, a boy only 19 years old and possibly the youngest officer to succeed to the command of a regiment throughout the war. A regiment of the 23rd Corps, which had come to Spring Hill as a train guard and was placed in support of the battery at the village, has persistently claimed that the salvation of our army was due to the heroic stand it made after all of Wagner's division had run away. In a historical sketch of the regiment occurs this statement. At Spring Hill, the regiment had another opportunity to show its pluck. A division that had been sent forward in charge of the trains was drawn up to resist any attack the rebels might make, while the regiment, being with the headquarters train, was ordered to support a battery so placed as to sweep an open field in front of the troops. The enemy, emerging from the woods, marched steadily up to the national lines when the entire division broke and ran. That is pretty strong language in view of the battle record of Wagner's division. Four of the four brigades out of all the brigades serving in all the Western armies, given prominent mention by Colonel Fox, in his book on regimental losses as famous fighting brigades, two, Opdyke's and Bradley's, belonged to Wagner's division, to say nothing of the very awkward fact 
that the brigades of Obdike and Lane were on the other side of Spring Hill, out of sight of Cleburne's attack, but it is seriously so stated. The entire division broke and ran, leaving the regiment and the battery to resist the attack. Fixing bayonets, the men awaited the onset. As soon as the enemy came within range, they poured a well-directed fire into their ranks, which, being seconded by the battery, caused them to waver. Portions of the retreating division having rallied, the rebels were compelled to betake themselves to the woods. End of the Battle of Spring Hill, Tennessee by John K. Schellenberger Section 1 Recording by Jyoti Taravanath